Good evening again. Now I'd like to introduce you to Ariel Ezraki, our first speaker, who's just going to give an initial introduction to digital economies and competition. I'm very pleased to have Ariel on board. He is a, a, a very distinguished academic who's worked in the area of competition and a digital economy for some time from currently professor at the University of Oxford and recently written a, a major book whose name I've just forgotten, but maybe you could, you, you could mention it. With that, uh, I will now leave the stage to Ariel to start his presentation. Thank you very much, Henry. Hi, everyone. Let me try and share the screen and hopefully it will work. So hopefully you can hear me and you can see the screen. So it's, it's a pleasure also to experiment with this new platform, very timely in, in terms of our subject matter. Now, what Henry asked me to do is to, to provide maybe 15 minutes of a presentation on the digital economy and introduce us to what is so special about it. We're all aware that the digital economy is changing a lot of the things and a lot of the dynamics of competition online. We read a lot of news stories and there are quite a lot of decisions and, and policy debate, which is quite uh, vivid on what is it that makes the um, digital economy so different from what we're used to when we look at brick and mortar, when we look at the high street and normal competition. So I'll spend a few minutes just explaining what's so different and then we'll go through a certain shopping list, getting a sense of what are the key issues that we look at from the competition perspective and what are the areas where we find there are quite a lot of challenges in terms of policy and enforcement. So the first slide, it's, it's, it's quite dense, but this is an attempt to bring in together all the things that you might hear about that explain why the dynamic of competition online is so different than what you see on the high street. And of course, it's important to start by emphasizing that we all benefit immensely uh, from the online environment, from digitalization. So the comments that I'm going to make now are just the result of us trying to focus on what can go wrong or what is not perfect when we look at the, at the dynamic of competition online. And the reasons that competition doesn't work as well online is that we have this aggregated effect of several characteristics that really tilt the market in favor of the key players. First, we have network effects. We have um, the effect that is the result of the fact that the platforms that we are using are increasing in value the more users we have. The more users we have, the more the platforms become attractive to advertisers and so forth. And those network effects make it very difficult for others to actually penetrate the market and challenge the existing platforms. Data became the new currency in our online environment. It's a critical input. Those who have the big data and the big analytics to accompany it usually have an advantage, a competitive advantage, and that is perfectly fine. The problem is that this can be a, used as a barrier to entry, something that prevents others from entering the market, and B, it can often be used to exploit us as customers. And this is something which is very common in the online environment. There is a clear asymmetry of information. Many of you will not be aware, and myself included, on how much information exactly is being harvested from your mobile phone at this moment. How much information is being harvested from your web browser, just as you joining this session? You are also unaware of what exactly is being done with this information, because a lot of what happens online is characterized by stealth, by the fact that the tracking, the harvesting, the targeting, and the manipulation are all below the surface for very good reasons, because otherwise we will start to object. So there is this whole machinery behind the scene and yet we are uh, extremely attracted to the offering online. And why is that? Because for many of us, it is very difficult to quantify exactly the cost of engaging with free services online. We see the price as zero, very hard for us to appreciate what is the impact on our privacy, how this can affect anything from our insurance premiums to credit rating, to the offering that we get online, these type of things. And in this game, one thing that is very important is to appreciate the power of the platforms. The platform economy is a relatively new player 
in the field. And the platforms are extremely beneficial to us. They connect between us and between sellers, between us and between information. But what happens is that because those platforms are so useful, they also grew in scope and in significance on the market. You see here a list of the eight largest companies in the world. Seven of them are platforms. And it gives you a sense of how significant those players became. Those platforms certainly affect the dynamics of competition. They affect what we can and cannot do online and also what we see online. And with this in mind, there has been a lively policy debate in the competition community, a debate that started uh, quite a few years back, trying to assess how exactly to address those issues. So the basic question, and that's a question that was characterizing the early debate was, is there at all a problem? I mean, is there anything that we should worry about or should we just celebrate all the goodness that the internet provides us with? After a few years, it became obvious that there are pockets where there is a problem, there is market power, there is abuse, there is exploitation. The next question has been, is that problem relevant to competition law? Should competition agencies intervene? Or is it something that maybe they, data protection laws should apply? Maybe it is about privacy. Is this a competitive, a competitive problem? And that led to another question, what is the scope of competition law? Because competition law, is affected by the legal regime in different jurisdictions and different jurisdictions might have different ideas as to how wide uh, it should be. And if it is something that is subjected to competition law or ought to be subjected to competition law, how wide should competition law be? Should we amend the law? How should we enforce? How do we make sure that we really target only those practices that give rise to concern and try to avoid instances that might chill competition? And a relatively uh, late comer into the discussion from the competition perspective has been uh, acknowledgement that we need to introduce also supplementary tools. And here is the question as to regulation. What is the relationship between competition law and regulations? What are the limits of competition law? And what can regulation do that competition law cannot? So this is the public debate at the background. And what I want to do now is just tell you a few stories of what are the things that people worry about? What are the cases that really attract our attention? Now, the first one, as the result of the story that I just told you, is obviously linked to market power. There is a real question whether leading platforms that benefit from market power also abuse their market power. You probably came across uh, news stories about Google search, uh, the Google shopping. There are also two other cases in Europe that involved Google. And just to give you an idea of what are the issues at stake, Google dominates the, the, the main market. There was a question of whether Google is using that power in order to benefit itself on a neighboring or an, uh, downstream market. In this case, it's the shopping uh, market. Google had its own Google shopping operation. It wasn't doing too well. The European Commission argued that what Google has done is basically lift Google shopping, put it at the top of the web search results, which led to us obviously clicking of what it is that we see on the first page. And that led to other shopping websites suffering as a result, not getting traffic and basically being ignored by us. And these are real questions for competition agencies. They involve economies uh, of scale. They involve behavioral economics. They involve manipulation. There are some interesting questions. How do we behave? To what extent do we control what it is that we do online? When you go to a web page, do you click on the first thing that you see? Or will you actually go to page four to look for a website that you remember? And what the commission argued is that in fact, those platforms can exert uh, a lot of power on our choices, which makes it very easy for platforms to favor their own operation. Uh, we now have ongoing investigations into Amazon and Apple that have similar themes at their background. Another slightly different question that arises from those platforms is the one of privacy. And this is something that was developed in Germany. We had a case in Germany with a German Bundeskartellamt, that's the federal cartel office, was looking at Facebook 
and questioning where, whether Facebook is abusing its market power by forcing users to allow it to merge information from Facebook, from WhatsApp, from Instagram. And this is a very interesting case, both because it is challenging what is the scope of competition, but it also highlights the extent to which certain activities can really impact on our well-being, on our ability to protect certain information, to remain anonymous when we are online, to control who has access to our data. Linked to that is another story, linked to the story of market power. And that is the understanding that those entities now control the whole ecosystem. So when you think about competition, often you think about companies that compete against others on a market. But Something which is quite interesting for some of these mega platforms is that competition actually takes place within the platform. And this is something that uh, my co-author Maurice Stack and I explore in the book uh, Competition Overdose. The idea that uh, Facebook or Google are not only competing on a market, they are a market in themselves, which means that they have sellers that come and operate on their market. They have buyers or users, which are us that are on that market and that means that they have elevated themselves to a level of little autonomies they determine what are the rules of competition they determine what is allowed and what is not so no longer do we have organic competition that just happens on the market what you have are private avenues massive avenues where the rules of competition the rules of the game who gets to enter who is not allowed to enter, who gets to sell, how much tax do you have to pay when you're selling, are now determined by those ecosystems. Let's move to another story that is really occupying quite a lot of people. And this is the understanding that when we spend time and we are increasingly spending more and more of our days online, when we're spending time within this digital environment, we're exposed to behavioral discrimination, to manipulation. And for those of you who remember the, the movie, The Truman Show, I think that's a, a nice image to have. Truman was walking uh, quite happy, feeling independent and feeling that he is in charge of his destiny. But all of that happened within this bubble that was created within the show. And in many ways, when you go online, the products that you see, the prices that you see are not a reflection of the high street. The news that you read are not a reflection of the market for news. They are a reflection of individualized patterns that are designed just for you. So while you may walk in a path feeling completely independent, you are actually walking in a path that was designed by whoever is running the platform. And to give you an insight into the technology involved, um, AI, artificial intelligence these days, can identify just by reading your texts, emails, your messages, how do you feel? So just by looking at the messages, it can classify you as insecure, overwhelmed, stress, and accordingly service you with the relevant ads that can engage you even more or serve you with news stories or with certain stories that will actually engage you further and further. The idea being to keep you as much as possible on the platform so money can be made from the information that is being harvested from you. And one thing that you probably are all aware of, personalized pricing, uh, plays a big role here. When you get a price online, many of the companies that sell you do not necessarily give you the competitive price. You're getting a price that was designed for you. There are algorithms that are on the other side and they are designed to identify whether you reached my website directly because you're loyal. And if that's the case, I will reward you actually with a higher price because I assume that you're unaware of other options. But if the algorithm identifies that you reached me because you first went to a search engine, then I know that you are aware of the competition. I might give you a discount. So a lot of games at the background that mean that the image that we see online is not necessarily the same image that you see when you just walk into a market. Another interesting element um, that affects competition online is the possibility to use algorithms and advanced methods to actually align the prices. So, of course, you can have cartels. People might agree uh, illicitly to fix the prices. Uh, what we have online is the possibility to establish cartels 
and then monitor them using algorithms. We even have the possibility of trying and creating algorithms that would automatically be able to push the prices up. There is a lot of debate and quite interesting um, experiments where artificial intelligence, Q-learning is used in order to check what would be the action that the algorithm will take. And they are able to push the price up without actually infringing the law in terms of the legal provisions as they are today. And that obviously opens the, the door to quite challenging questions. Should we change the law? Should we have different rules when it comes to algorithm, when, we come to, when it comes to the way you design uh, the online framework? And lastly, I'll say a few words about mergers. Of course, that's another um, thing that occupies the mind of a lot of policymakers and competition officials. Increased concentrations as the result of mergers can cause a lot of problems, can result in increase in price. At the same time, mergers are extremely beneficial because they can provide efficiencies, they can provide economies of scale, they allow technology, they allow innovation. So there is a very careful balancing exercise, and that balancing exercise that competition agencies engage in is becoming more challenging because we now have big data and big analytics, and we don't always fully understand what is the role of data. Just now, we have Google Fitbit. This is a merger that has been proposed and is now under review in several jurisdictions. So that is a big deal, and there are big questions on whether the information that Fitbit had on you should be allowed uh, to be merged into Google and the analytics and the power that they have. Should there be any restrictions on such a merger? Another interesting case that is now uh, relatively old, when Facebook acquired uh, WhatsApp, what exactly is the value of data? Should we object when you have a massive platform getting another chunk and another possibility to track you and get an insight basically to your behavioral surplus. So things for us to think about. How competitive really is the online environment? Of course, there are many instances when we see fierce competition, but sometimes what we have is only the facade of competition. And in fact, everything is relatively controlled by very few players. In competition, we speak about the invisible hand, and there is a question, to what extent is the invisible hand relevant where everything is determined by algorithms? Is it now that we moved into um, an artificial market and we should look into the algorithms and the way they affect competition? And when we think of it from a competitive perspective, we have to be very careful. If we over-intervene, we might chill innovation, we might chill competition. If we under-intervene, of course, that's not good. So there is a very delicate exercise and with relatively limited information and very fast evolving market, uh, that's quite challenging. And maybe last comment, I mentioned now a lot of markets and mainly in the context of services and goods, but we should remember that all these stories are also relevant when it comes to the market of ideas. The same control also affect the market for ideas, affect the news stories you see affect the possibility to manipulate people. So should we extend the application of competition law or our thoughts about the, competitives of the, mar the competitiveness of the market also to issues such as democracy uh, and autonomy? I'll, I'll stop with that so we can engage in, in a more open discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariel. That was that was a brilliant overview of a huge <laughs> range of issues that uh, we'll be able to get into further. What I'm going to do now, though, is ask everyone to do a bit of networking, chat to people about your views, why you're interested in the digital economy, what you've got out of it. What has anything surprised you, or is this something you know you're all aware of? And I will set it up so it'll be ten minutes. And then we'll come back and we'll have uh, a Q&A. OK, look forward to talking to you in 10 minutes. Farewell for the moment. Hello, everyone. I, I hope you're having a chat. Um, we will go now into Q&A mode. Oh, we've got one. Oh, no, Q&A, we've got some. OK. Ariel, what are your thoughts regarding marketplaces and platforms getting involved in pricing policies by sellers? What are my thoughts? It's not, these are not my thoughts. Uh, these are the thoughts of competition law on these uh, issues. One of the things 
worry about is something that is called hi team join us Mir maybe miriam can join us as well yeah may as well. Miriam, can you join us as well so basically one of the things we worry about is when you have something that we sometimes refer to as either hub and spoke or resale price maintenance the problem being um that if you have a single entity that is determining the price downstream it can create alignment and that's something which is bad there are other elements but this is the main risk the main risk that we worry about is collusion the other things that you worry about is resale price maintenance where you remove the possibility of someone to give discounts uh, because you have a certain interest as the seller or as the platform if you think about platforms there are issues when the platform might have an interest because of the tax that it is charging so quite a lot of things but generally speaking a platform should not should not intervene in in pricing directly if that results in uh, and I'm talking about it very broadly if that results in anything that looks like uh, collusion I don't know if Miriam and Tim if you want to maybe join in or I don't know Henry what's yeah, I can I can make a comment if it's um, helpful. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I was going to mention this a bit uh, further on when I get to speak, but I'll mention it now. If you look at what's happening on Amazon, there's a investigation going on by the European Commission in relation to Amazon. Amazon has a marketplace, so third parties can put their products on Amazon. And the allegation is, and I put it no higher than that, the allegation is that Amazon looks at what people are selling and judges what they're selling and says, oh, this one looks like it's doing really well. We'll make one of our own. And then you have the Amazon version of that thing promoted to the top of their internal search system. And they make a lot of money off the back of somebody else's idea. So the allegation goes. That's an ex a clear example of getting involved in somebody else's pricing. Why? Because the Federal Trade Commission investigated about 18 months ago that Amazon imposes on its marketplace players a most favored nation clause so that they can't offer the same price <clears throat> on another platform. And the consequence of that is because Amazon is so big, particularly in the States, uh, that's led to widespread price increases across the board. A class action was filed against Amazon in Seattle in March uh, for that practice because even though allegedly Amazon did it and Federal Trade Commission investigated and they didn't, they stopped moving in that way, they appear to be continuing with the practice. So there's a current you know, piece of litigation about precisely that in terms of platforms. And if I may just do it, just because you mentioned, mentioned that, that, also relevant, of course, for the hotel sector. sector where we had whether it's wide or narrow um, parity clause but certainly something that is quite challenging and there isn't necessarily an agreement as to the line that separates what is acceptable and what is not I'm just looking at the, the questions. We've got one at the top. Do you think it is there's a new kind of threat to competition or do governments think it is basically the same problems of the past, like too many mergers? Yeah. So is there something fundamentally different in competition on a network compared to uh, normal sort of competition problems? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to have a first go. I mean, that's, I think, the key question. Is it old old wine in a new bottle? or is it something new? And at the beginning, we came out with a book uh, four years ago called um, Virtual Competition. And one of the arguments against us from many of the leading platforms was, there's nothing new. You just, you know, you're just making a big fuss out of nothing. And competition law can deal with that, and there isn't a big issue. And I think, luckily for us as consumers and citizens, there is now an increased realization that there, that there is something um, different. The threat is different because of the magnitude, because of the network effects, because of the ability um, to really control so much more of the competitive process. The tools, there there is quite a lot of disagreement uh, in terms of what are the right tools. In the US you have an approach that might be changing these 
this year seems to be changing slightly, but much more conservative approach. In Europe, we have a slightly different approach, but still an argument that we do not need to change the tools. But then again, as I mentioned briefly recently, there is a call for maybe increased regulatory tools, again, to address that. controversial comment. I'm going to disagree with Ariel. I think it is old wine in new bottles. I'll give you a couple of examples. If you look at a communication platform like Facebook, the fact that it can discriminate in one way or another is exactly the same sort of thing that happens in telecoms and has happened in telecoms for over 100 years. Because what we're talking about is a communication platform and the economics are very much the same. You've got very, 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 very here to the moon and back high fixed costs, there's huge amounts of investment, huge amounts of intellectual property, and it's very, very difficult to compete. So what you've got is a monopoly in social media. The thing I think that is new is how quickly these things can be created and how slow the authorities are at dealing with them. In the past, it took quite a while for Standard Oil to get to the position it was in, and it then took quite a long time for government to do anything about it. But that kind of evened out, evened out. I think the difference now is that every time an authority catches or finds a problem, so if you look at the cases we brought against Google on search, every single uh, product that is identified by Google, whether it's maps or news or you know any one of those products at the top of the tabs, they've been treated the same way, but the commission only attacked search. So, you know, there were settlements on images, but it doesn't mean that the problem which was identified then has a solution which is across the board. And there clearly needs to be a much more across the board set of solutions, because if everybody that's affected has to take an individual case, it literally will take to forever for the law to be complied with. Thanks, Jim. That's it. Miriam, do you think this is a totally different situation than we're in, or is it just more of the same but bigger and grander? I think on some level it's got to be completely, completely different, just in so much as kind of the magnitude of transformation that we're seeing in the in the economy just now. If we take areas like data collection, kind of future markets predictions. These kind of areas, I, I would say that there's there are elements of those that replicate economic behaviours of the past, but I suppose it's different in so much as the kind of scale and pace at which it's accelerating, kind of creates a kind of differentiates it, I suppose, from from kind of past behaviours. I may just just add something, Henry, because in a way I think both Tim, Miriam, and I actually agree when we say uh, that this is something new. The key here is that those that argue that this is an old, just an old problem, then say there's no problem to fix because so this is where the debate comes from. They say, look, this is there's nothing new. And, and this is why I think uh, Tim and I and Miriam probably agree. And the argument is, no, the dynamics have changed so much that if you're using the old tools and you say there's nothing new, that many people, and this, by the way, is what happened in the U.S. for the past decade, Agencies looking at things that I think for us in Europe seem quite problematic and saying, hey, you know what, I, we don't see the problem. Instead of appreciating that now we need to look at behavioral aspects, we need to look at uh, behavioral economics, at human approach to, to search, biases, the ability to capture. And in that respect, once you take that into account, you cannot say, I mean, of course, the list that I had on the first slide all the issues there are recognizable. But when you look at the aggregated effect, in my mind at least, and, and maybe others will disagree, this creates a fundamental change. And if you don't accept that fundamental change, then you will stay seated and say, because it doesn't click and it doesn't trigger anything under my old regime, there's no problem. If it cannot be quantified, there's no problem. I would argue that we passed that stage and I suspect both Tim and Miriam would agree with me, but if not, that's fine. <laughs> I, I agree with that insofar as it goes. I think um, there's one very big difference, which is probably an assumption that was baked into the pre-existing law. And that I think, you know, most, most law-abiding people 
kind of expect that if people break the law, then there's a, you know, they're going to be sanctioned and they're going to comply. I think the big difference is actually the economics of platforms, where what that leads to is you've got these very, 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 very high profits. And there, where the law starts with a sanction that says, okay, I'm going to fine you, the fine is absolutely worthless. You know, even you find the absolute maximum, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's immaterial because the level of profit far and away outstrips the fine. So the fines in European competition are a 10% of worldwide turnover. That sounds like a lot of money. But if you're making 90% profits, you can just keep paying the fines for the rest of eternity and you merrily, you know, sail on, pay as many fines as possible, fight as long as possible. And there's absolutely no incentive towards compliance. Now, we used to have in this country a excess, you know, a, an ability to go for exemplary damages. But unfortunately, that was changed under the, the damages directive that was brought in recently, which was really designed to give people the ability to get damages. But, but that's gone. So there's, there's actually very, very limited incentives to compliance. So if we're looking at looking to the future, which is kind of likely in September, whether there's going to be new regulation, one of the things that I really hope for is something that is really severe and forces companies to comply rather than you know, gives them a, a, a free ride and, and an opportunity to break the law and make a huge profit. Okay, I'm going... Oh, oh I'm echoing as well. I've got earplugs in now, which apparently should help. So I don't know how that was quite happening. What I'd like to do because is to move on to the next topic, but we'll leave these questions here. We can come back to them. But I just want to ask a question of all of you. This is, you know, to, to explore... How does potentially uh, the pandemic affect these dynamics, do you think? And I mean, that is both the sort of increased market uh, power, but also obviously the political context uh, and how that might change the willingness towards reform or not. And I thought I'd ask Miriam to start as she's had less space to, to date. And, and we'll just go, we'll go through those topics and then we'll return to the questions. Now, do remember, you can click the questions in the Q&A, people in the audience, and vote them, and then they're more likely to get answered. And do ask your own. Obviously, you can also chat and make comments and so forth as well. So with that, Miriam, would you like to switch on your mic and uh, say a few words? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's great. Great. Thank you so much for um, inviting me along tonight. This is a really interesting discussion and thanks to Ariel and Tim for brilliant contributions. I suppose the, the capacity in which I'm here is slightly different. I'm not, I'm not an academic. We, I work for a think tank called Commonwealth and their director of research and advocacy. And we recently published a paper on looking at the future of digital infrastructure within the context of COVID-19. And I suppose the kind of effects of covid Right across the board of the economy, I think it's not just related to digital infrastructure, the effects of COVID, as well as creating new economic vulnerabilities, has exposed deep fractures in the economy that already existed. And I think that's very true of, of digital infrastructure and the digital economy. And um, we've got people working from home, we've got students trying to trying to work from home. And we're also seeing a kind of increased digital divide as part of that and part of these conversations that probably should have been had a long time ago around the nature of the digital divide and how a market orientated approach to um, digital infrastructure has facilitated that. And I think the need for a high speed internet and the kind of inadequacies of the for profit corporate model of delivering digital infrastructure has been highlighted in the process. And we've seen that the market led approach to digital infrastructure undertaken kind of by and for largely a handful of corporations, certainly in the UK, has brought with it a host of problems from the prioritisation of shareholder returns to kind of over investing in over kind of investing in vital infrastructures and the undemocratic ownership and governance of essential services. And I want to pick out one figure here because I find it really striking is that the UK is ranked 35th out of 37 countries assessed by the OECD for the proportion of fibre connection in its total fixed broadband infrastructure. And only 13% of households have full fibre 
connection just now. So what our report recommends is that we take a series of policy measures forward, but first and foremost that these are rooted in a new value system that recognises the internet and the digital infrastructure in a new light. So looking at one, connectivity is a basic need that should be met free at the point of use for all. That may seem kind of obvious, but that isn't something that we currently have in the kind of market orientated approach. Secondly, to empower citizens and workers through participation, transparency, accountability, so that digital technologies can function as tools to allow people to engage directly in decision making. Looking at the reduction of corporate concentration, political power by replacing for profit corporations with democratic alternatives and looking at how we could link the digital infrastructure to ecological sustainability and the Green New Deal so that digital technologies and can play a role in supporting new systems that are efficient and resilient and decarbonized. And lastly, within the new value system, looking at ensuring that people have control and power over their own data, which we can develop an ethical data management strategy. And I, I should say the report's mainly focused on, on internet and broadband connection, and we'll be publishing reports um, that will probably allude to what Ariel and Tim were referring to earlier on there on um, surveillance data and intellectual property. I think we'll touch upon kind of some of these some of these themes that were discussed earlier on as well. They'll be released later on in the year. So I, I'll, I'll kind of briefly speak through some of the recommendations that we put in the report. The first would be the creation of a new public infrastructure company um, with the mission to deliver full fibre um, network by 2030. The UK government's own analysis on this actually suggests that a monopoly provider would deliver um, nationwide full fibre faster and at a much lower cost than through kind of enhanced competition among the current private companies. So that kind of public infrastructure company could be created to task with the rollout of 100% full fibre network by 2030, based on taking open reach and kind of parts of the BT group relevant to the rollout of the core network into public ownership. And I think core to this is looking at the fact that rather than paying dividends, that company could reinvest profits back into the rolling network. So as an example, BT has paid out £53 billion in dividends since its privatisation over the past decade, has seen its fixed investments and R&D spending fall as a shareholder payouts have actually risen. So I think that's kind of a good example to contextualise where we're at. The second key ask is looking at the kind of decommodification of connection. So internet access organised as a 21st century human right, which is already recognised in many institutions as that. So once the UK's full fibre network is complete, public ownership of infrastructure, rather than by companies organised to maximise shareholder value, um, could enable connection to be organised based on universal decommodified connection with the operating and connecting costs covered through general taxation. Um, the next key ask is looking at ensuring accountability and democratic control of digital infrastructure. So looking at areas like the extension of democratic ownership um, being accompanied by steps to transform the accountability and democratic control of, of that infrastructure. So areas like a new digital platform for debating and deciding national and local digital priorities, funding and support for community initiatives, publicly owned or cooperative kind of um, marker labs and co-op uh, and co-working spaces that are accessible both to people in different generations and socioeconomic groups could help kind of bridge the digital divide by supporting digital skills and digital infrastructure to drive decarbonisation. So looking at the installation development of bringing that into the debate around about around a kind of broader decarbonisation strategy. And the last one's looking at the public cloud infrastructure. So We've seen kind of further consolidation of the power of big tech companies um, through cloud infrastructure and the dominance of cloud computing infrastructures, a source of kind of very significant revenue to big tech companies and infrastructural power um, over the direction of the economy more broadly, as was alluded to in the earlier discussions. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there and, and not speak much longer because I'm conscious of taking you, up too uh, much. Mary, can you address uh, the key point that, that, you know, how do you think the current pandemic makes it more or less likely that what you're proposing is actually going to take, get taken up? I would hope, <laughs> yes, I hope, I would hope that actually it would be seen as a moment to reassess the digital infrastructure. 
like I said, you know, we've got students working from home, we've got people working from home. The digital divide has never been more visible. And actually, we've got the government having to take in and, and take steps to uh, subsidise broadband connection for households that don't have it for students, for example. I think if we look back to November 2019, when a similar suggestion was made, it was called broadband communism, but we call it something else now. But, you know, and I think actually, so I, I don't know what the response will be. I would like to think that actually they would look at this moment. They would look at the fact that students don't have access to the Internet, that households don't have access to the Internet, that that access to the Internet is often a lot slower than it is. It's often further behind than our um competitors in the OECD, as was highlighted by that. And then you can look at the disproportionate shareholder payouts by kind of monopoly like for-profit corporate ownership of the digital infrastructure. And I would like to think that the, all of those kind of areas combined would have a kind of, a, would trigger a moment of reassessment from the government as to what their current strategy is with digital infrastructure and how they could go about um, maybe one of the ways that we suggested how they could go about seeking to kind of reconcile and bridge that digital divide. Thank you, Maria. Can you switch your, your microphone off? So just um, to, of to make sure that was, you know, is this a, you know, we can spend a lot of time around the edge, the detail of competition, patching it up, etc. But is this the time for more radical action? And do you think that could actually be driven at all by the current context? Yeah, our mic's on. I, I think there is more radical action. I wanted to make three points. The first one is that just before Easter, it was reported that two million pints of milk were being poured down the drain. I was very puzzled by that because I'd also heard reports that that there was hoarding going on, that there were people out trying to you know, get as many pints of milk as possible. So how could it be that you've got both demand and supply mismatching like that? So I looked into it. I'm, I'm, I've written a, a paper on this, which is going to be published shortly. And what, what, it, what it turns out is that our supply chains in the UK are vertically integrated. It's not really much of a surprise. So the reason for the milk being poured away is that there's a whole bunch of suppliers out there that are there to supply restaurants and to supply sandwich shops and to supply things that people weren't using anymore. So what happened, and you know, the, the, all of the reports about hoarding, probably less true, about 60% of the capacity in the UK for the supply of foodstuffs goes through supermarkets, but 40% doesn't. It goes into restaurant and pre-prepared stuff and booker and all of those different supply chains. And there is an inability to switch between the two. So I think that's the first thing, because that, if you like, is a problem. And then you look at, well, has anybody, your question, Henry, was, you know, who's profiting from this? Is there a COVID winner? And I'd say, yes, there is a COVID winner. Supermarkets not just because demand has gone up for supermarkets, but also because in their munificence and generosity, they cancelled the discounts and buy one, get one free offers and promotions. That's because they didn't need to promote and they didn't need people to uh, go to their shops in competition with others. Because what was keeping them in, what was keeping prices in check was people madly shopping around between different locations. And mad shoppers can't go out and mad shoppers can't go around shopping from different locations. So there's a restriction on catchment areas by geography. So what's happened is that prices have actually gone up. Now, I've followed this for the last two months, and you'd be happy to know or sad to know that your shopping basket of, has actually gone up in price because of the cancellation of discounts uh, quite considerably. The Office of National Statistics released that last Friday. And there's a massive correlation between prices and, you know, the, the the discount being cancelled and the continued increase in volume. Now, that's actually number one. That's the first winner, if you like. Number two is anybody who's been managing to corner the market, because with this shifting and change in, in demand, there has been opportunities for the unscrupulous to make money out of the misery of the unwary. 
And where would you expect that to be? Well, there's obviously an increased demand for hand sanitizer. There have been over 20,000, which is, I think it's absolutely staggering, 20,000 complaints to the CMA in the last month and a half. A large proportion of those relate to things like hand sanitizer and PPE. Why? Because the unscrupulous have been raising the price. Hand sanitizer has gone up. I'll just check my, my notes. Hand wash, ventilators, hand sanitizer has gone up by 400%. Now, that's just shockingly bad. So you asked, is there a case for intervention? Well, under competition law, we can hit excessive pricing. You can take claims for excessive pricing. But typically, it's only easy to take those claims against dominant companies, and dominance companies have to be measured over more than a month. So what happens in, in this country is that it, you know, people get to make their money, and the theory is that you're going to bring other people into the market. But of course, that's no good. That's no good in times of pandemic, when what you're doing is exploiting the weak and the vulnerable. So what actually happens in many other countries, I'll give the example of, of California. California has a law which is an anti-price gouging law. Gouging is when, I've only ever heard it in the context of ripping someone's eye out, where you gouge it out. So what price gouging is about is it's you're taking money out of the hands of the vulnerable as a supplier. So what happens in, in California, because they have, you know, not necessarily pandemic, but they have emergencies, that when there's a declared emergency, suppliers can't raise price by more than 10% on the preceding month. Uh, and if you do, it's a criminal offence. Now, we haven't got those laws here. And I think for those that have exploited the situation, personally, I think they should be introduced. I think that's kind of the first response to the, if you like, the second question. The answer to the supply chain question, I think, is also available to us. I think if you looked at the structure of supply in the UK, we could look at that under a market investigation. We do have the powers now to do that. And I think the, you know, the fundamental problem there is that we've allowed merger after merger you know, Tesco acquired Booker, which is one of the intermediate wholesalers. So we don't have that switching across different supply chains that would be there in a competitive market at different levels in the market. They've become vertically integrated. And that's kind of an aspect of monopsony. It's kind of an access where the, where the retailer's got too much power over the chain. So there is a case for saying that there should be an investigation of of the terms on which supplies are made so that your milk supplier doesn't pour the milk away, but in times of emergency is able to supply others. Because clearly, if you're looking for milk and you can't find it and someone's pouring it away, it's massively wasteful. You know, forget all of the you know, economic theories of this consumer welfare. It's massively, obviously, disastrously well wasteful. And it should actually be driving prices down if there's an oversupply on one side of the market it should be driving prices down in other places where where there's demand. But that hasn't been able to happen, probably because of these restrictive structures in supply chains. So uh, those are two examples. I gave you another one earlier about Amazon. I won't go into that. Amazon's clearly a life down in lockdown for many. It's a fantastic company that delivers things extremely well and is making huge, absolutely enormous untaxed profits in this country, probably at the expense of the high street and the changing behavior which is taking place is it wrong you know query discuss the european commission is probably going to launch its statement of objections on amazon sometime this week or possibly next on the issue of the marketplace i think amazon has a lot of questions to answer but i think we're, we you know we are actually living with an issue there where the behavior has probably changed i think it's a fantastic organization i buy lots of things on amazon but it's not really very competitive if, you know, prices are likely to be inflated over time if they are allowed to continue to do what has been alleged. If indeed that is true, I said very carefully, realising I might be getting into deep water with that one. So there are there are three potential winners, you know, supermarkets, Amazon and the unscrupulous. And there are things that should be done about them, but probably haven't been done to date. I do think there's going to be any move to actually, actually address the, address the, the increasing the power. power. There has been a proposal put forward by the CMA, I understand, to put in place anti-price gouging law. 
I haven't seen where that's got to. It's supported by which the consumer organization, which, and surprisingly, Boris Johnson was asked a question, which is probably a set up question, whether he thought it was a good idea. And he said, yes, of course. So then obviously that's probably going to happen when, when it's going to happen in all, you know, like the British summer, we're expecting that it's going to be sunshine, but it's going to rain. You know, it's probably going to come along just at the moment after it's really needed. But, you know, that it hasn't happened yet. So it, it's probably too late already. The question of do we think, do I think there's going to be, you know, further actions? Yes. You know, this summer has, is really becoming the attack on the platform summer. We know that there's a case against Amazon in the pipeline at European level. There's cases in America against Amazon. But if the European Commission follows up on Amazon, then it will have dealt with, badly dealt with Google. It, it is currently this week launching actions against Apple. So if you've got Google, Apple, Amazon, the only one the Commission hasn't really dealt with is Facebook. But the Germans, the German cartel amp is having a pretty good go at Facebook. I can see that possibly being next. And there is a potential proposal for a Digital Services Act in September, which would regulate access to platforms so that these type of things don't happen in the future. Uh, final point I'd make is that there is a CMA inquiry, which is due to report on the beginning of the week, first week of July, which has already listed a bunch of remedies that should be applicable. And there's a lot of people with their fingers crossed that they're actually going to impose remedies or, or at least consult on remedies rather than suggest there should be a further report or a further investigation. I mean, I, very much in line with what, you know, the themes that were already discussed. I think what COVID-19, in the context of COVID-19, what it showed us is probably the centrality. If, if we're focusing on the digital economy, it's just the centrality of digitalization in our life. In many ways, we're lucky. I think the fact that we can engage in that discussion with such an amazing platform like now, I mean, this will not have happened 10 years ago. So while we appreciate the, the centrality of digital markets and maybe the need to intervene, of course, we all benefit immensely. Would that change the level of intervention? I think the processes that we see, at least in the area of competition law, have started well before COVID-19 and will continue afterwards. It's kind of, it's a driver. It, it probably highlighted how what happens online can also impact on the high street. It highlighted how so many different elements of our livelihood are governed uh, by online platforms. And there are many benefits, but also, as, as all of us mentioned, quite a few uh, drawbacks. So, so this is uh, the relationship between COVID and digitalization. Would there be action? The main thing on the table at the moment is the commission consultation. This is a, a big deal. We're all awaiting to see what will happen at the end of this proposed regulatory tool that the commission might use, something that can be a game changer. Competition law is viewed as a very flexible and valuable tool, but many of us accept that it has limitations. It is reactive. So regulatory instruments can lead uh, to a change, but to get it right, to do it in a way that doesn't chill innovation, doesn't chill competition, doesn't chill investment, is, is not easy. So th this is the, 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 the next big thing. Last comment from my end, if we speak about COVID-19 and it has uh, uh, less to do with digitalization, is one thing that I find interesting about the difficult situation in which we are is that it also highlights the different types of competition that we have. And Tim mentioned some types, you know, when competition works and where, where it doesn't. And obviously the example of the supermarket is an excellent example of what happens when customers have no outside options and sellers can use uh, their market power. Generally speaking, we often assume that competition is always good and we assume that markets will deliver the best results. Two things that I find interesting in the current scenario is that they also expose the limitations of the competitive process and sometimes the need for government intervention. The first is with respect to research. There has been actually, there were efforts to invest in new technology and new vaccinations that could have been relatively useful for COVID-19. 
And that happened in the US. And at some point, the US government uh, decided to step out of that market and stop supporting that research, saying that if it is something that is valuable, the market powers, the market forces will deliver the vaccine. And of course, they didn't because there wasn't a really good market at the time. It wasn't such a good business opportunity. And in my mind, it just shows that we need to understand the limits of markets. We need to understand that sometimes governments have responsibility. They have to step in. Not everything in our modern Western society can be delivered by markets. Uh, markets sometimes, even when they are competitive, even when you don't have market power, just don't deliver the desired results. So what is efficient is not necessarily what is in line with the human or social interest that we have. And that's something that I find very important because a lot of the times, every time you mention that maybe the government need to take a step, take a step and intervene, you're told by quite a lot of people, governments get it wrong. And it's true, governments do get it wrong quite often. But I think it's just important to understand markets also don't always deliver. And just to give you another example, as you know, all the countries at the beginning were fighting against each other for PPEs and for ventilators. And it's quite an interesting story. If you look at the US, you have Governor Cuomo saying that it was like the Wild West. Every time he had to increase the bid for ventilators as another state in the US increased its bid for ventilators. So they were basically paying massive prices to some suppliers. And I think that's another example. Sometimes what you have is, is, is a, a toxic uh, spiraling effect where the competition is not the type of competition that we as society want. And that, in my mind, is a good example of government failure in the US where the federal government didn't take action. I'm sure we can have examples of government failures also in Europe and in the UK. But the point being that our starting assumption that markets often deliver what we need in some ways was pressure tested by this pandemic and that that is something that i find uh, quite interesting and quite provocative in some ways i'll i'll, I'll end with that well i mean it's, it's interesting because there's a fundamental sort of divide that you start with the assumption that markets work then well it's just a case of twiddling around the edges to you know there will be a regulatory solution but and I think there seems to be a big divide between you and, uh, and Tim on the one side saying, well, we can fix it and competition policy is a good thing. It just needs to work better. And I suppose Miriam's perspective is actually you need different sorts of organizations driven by uh, public values because competition is just an ongoing game. And it seems that uh, the big players hold all the cards and are going to keep winning it. And uh, I mean, what chance does the European Commission, in, in real terms, to actually take off these big organizations based in the US with Trump backing? I mean, what real power do they have? I mean, given the international conflictual nature in, in politics. I don't know who's willing to answer that. We heard, but I mean, Miriam, where, where do you see, I mean, why you've broken totally out of that competition form, but it seems, you know, Ariel and Tim are, part of the game or key people in it and it's just not it doesn't seem to be on their radar yeah i mean i think there's a, a series of kind of proposals that could be put forward i suppose i lack faith in the ability to reform and um, the kind of key drivers in a model operated by for-profit corporations, how to kind of transform the value system in which they're delivering digital infrastructure, if we see it as a human right, and at the kind of speed and pace that we want to see it, I think I'd hold reservations around the ability to do that. So we'd look at maybe kind of alternative models of ownership to that, whether that's looking at a, a state-owned public infrastructure company, whether that's looking at alternative to cloud, infrastructure, whether that's looking at areas like community broadband projects, which have been rolled out in, in various places throughout the UK quite successfully. So I suppose, and I've, I noticed that I've just got a question here looking at other than public subsidy for digital access and service, what other policies would you suggest? So I, I suppose kind of on that, I, I wouldn't see the kind of transition in ownership towards one where, where we have a stake and say in the rollout of digital infrastructure as a public subsidy as such. I think it's, that, that's something slightly different as publicly owned 
infrastructure um as we have as we have just now i think there are issues with the public subsidizing some for example of the kind of key drivers of of the corporate model to deliver digital infrastructure if we look at bt shareholder payouts that's very evident there so i thought i suppose to take issue slightly with the frame and around that i see this as something much bigger and kind of more holistic than uh, kind of com more more comprehensive rather than public public subsidy so yeah, I suppose just to, to run through some of the other kind of recommendations in the report, community broadband initiatives are one of those, like I said, these have been rolled out um, in areas in the north of England and particularly in some of the rural areas fairly successfully as well. So I, I think it's important to note the kind of plurality of different models of ownership that we could have going forward here. I think part of it's about participation and, uh, and kind of broader participation in helping shape the policy of digital infrastructure going forward. So looking at, for example, kind of online spaces to debate local and, and national digital infrastructure policy making and kind of helping to shape that decision making. That could be done, for example, in Scotland through the, the Citizen Assembly as a kind of key subject area to be debated and brought forward as kind of bringing the approach um, to the rollout of digital infrastructure. We could also look at kind of expanding some of the regulatory frameworks for kind of monitoring full fibre technologies. Um, so looking at kind of bringing in kind of more more regulation around, for example, invasive surveillance. Yeah, Mary, um, can I, just, I just want to stop you because you, you're putting a lot of detail there and people are going to get lost. I mean, let's just go back <laughs> to the politics because people might also say that this agenda that you're proposing was a Corbyn agenda and is now dead. Is that true? Are there any signs actually the the new Labour leadership have any interest in, in this or uh, is that history? No, not at all. So there was a kind of campaign run by Kat Hobbs at, at We Own It when Keir Starmer was in the, the running for Labour leadership to ensure that they're still supportive of public ownership campaigns. Broadband was part of that and he signed up to that. So no, that's not history in so much as that's still Labour Party policy. Um, I think it's not history because COVID is also showing that actually we need a, a greater stake in terms of intervention in the digital infrastructure that we have just now. We're looking just now at a Conservative government intervening um, to ensure that young people have access to broadband. So no, you know, in this climate just now and with the current opposition leader, no, it's not off the table. Thank you. Thanks. Let's, let's, we'll, we'll just go and take another different question. The one I don't really understand from Manuel Ariel. Do you consider leveraging as theory of harm relevant in platform markets? Can I consider leveraging as bottom line in cases against Google, Amazon, and Apple? It did get three votes. So it, by, what does it actually mean? Uh, what's the point being there? You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Well, you missed. I said something really smart, but now I'll just. Uh... <laughs> So leveraging is, is, is a relatively central theory of harm when we deal with Article 102, with abuse of dominant position in Europe. And the key idea behind it is that you have a dominant player that controls one market, and that dominant player also competes on another market. We call it the downstream market. And what we say is that instead of competing on merit in the downstream market, instead of trying to be the best on that market, what the dominant player is doing is using its power in the other market in order to win the competition on that market. And the Google example is exactly this type of theory of harm, the Google shopping case, where Google controls search. Google was not doing too well with Google shopping. Other shopping websites were doing better than Google's own shopping service. So what Google did, instead of competing against them on that market, it just used its power as being the one in control of the search engine. And according to the commission, Google then favored its own operation by putting it at the top above the organic search. And that is the theory of harm that the commission is advancing. It is not about refusal to supply or refusal to grant access. It is about favoring your own operation. Tim mentioned Amazon, the same notions, different story, of course, but the same idea. Amazon controls the market space. Amazon also sells on the market space. You or I want to have a business and we just identify this wonderful niche where we're making a lot of money. 
Amazon algorithms identify that this is valuable, harvest information that it can harvest only because the marketplace belongs to it. This is all allegedly, obviously, from what we understand the commission is looking at. And therefore, the argument being Amazon then uses its market power as the owner, the game maker, the owner of the platform, and improves its own position downstream. And the same would be, you can tell the Apple uh, Spotify story using the same theory. So it is quite a powerful theory of harm, but it has different grades. We have established case law when we speak about leveraging, when it's refusal to grant access, refusal to license. What the European Commission has done with Google is develop a standalone theory of harm. And this is what Google is objecting to, among many other things, in its attempt to, to quash the Commission's decision. So, so yes, it, it, because of the nature of platforms, because of market power, a lot of the stories that we hear can be linked back to this, this type of story. Just quickly, you said that the platforms read the emails. How do they do this? So not all platforms, and I will refrain from naming names just because, but the technology is there to begin with. So there are a lot of reports about the technology, both from within some of the corporations and from outside in terms of the ability to harvest texts, to harvest, I, I, I didn't necessarily say emails, but if I said it's also true for emails, but it's mostly relevant in our current discussion to you being on social media, to you using text, and basically algorithms being able to identify certain patterns, identify certain words, and those words are then being used in order to develop a certain profile that tells us how you might behave. A while back, Facebook was accused, Facebook has the technology. It was accused of using it for advertising. Facebook rejected that. Some providers of mail services, again, were accused of uh, using uh, this technology to read the mail and therefore, and, and following that, use that information. What we call sometimes, uh, Shoshana Zabov calls it behavioral surplus. The whole idea is any indication that I can have to gain more information about you, I use. And this is the new market reality where the asset is the behavioral surplus and, and that is done by very smart algorithms uh, that can identify patterns, can identify text, can identify how you react, can identify where you surf. You have cookies on your web page, you have third-party cookies. We have a handful of key players that use a lot of tools to get as much surplus as they can. And definitely that in involves reading emails, but I will not, not name names. Thanks very much, Aria. I'm going to, I mean, it's very interesting, this, you know, this continuous game. Uh, it seems to me, you know, we've got this incredibly complex debate. We've had various questions, you know, about technicalities that most people won't understand. And on the other hand, we've got this very broad brush debate on really are the structures wrong or right. And I think in this particular event, we're not going to get to the bottom of that. So what I'm proposing now is to end the formal presentation and suggest that everyone on the platform goes down and joins the table. And people who have still have questions that aren't answered, so Denise, go and find Ariel and ask him your questions. You should be able to see him with his photo on the floor at a table. And William, you can look maybe Tim and ask him your questions and so on. And let's just use the actual ability of the, the system to go and find people and and have a, a brief conversation and the, the session will close the, the session at nine obviously people can, can leave earlier but do just wander around and get your further questions uh, answered but before we do that i would just like to thank everyone thank ariel tim and maria very much you have taken on a big challenge of taking on a totally new platform which has had a few glitches um and i think we are going to have to talk to our friends who run it a bit to try and work out exactly make sure that I am those out. But I think hopefully apart from that, it's been not too bad an experience. It'll be interesting to see how the, the, the sort of final networking, but obviously if you don't want to keep uh, around, that, that's fine, but let, let, let's have a go. So thanks very much. And at the end of the, this bit of the, of the evening. Okay, cheers, bye.